a great pleasure to be here. I want to start out in southern Zambia. We have two farmers' fields here. The maize field in the back belongs to Bernard. And notice that the maize there is tall and vibrant green and densely planted. And each plant supports two full, large maize cobs. The field in the front belongs to Mutinta. Only a few plants grew, and they're stunted and yellow. And the few cobs that were produced are tiny, not much larger than Mutinta's finger. A poor widow, Mutinta worries about how she'll feed herself and her family with such a poor harvest. We asked her, Mutinta, what happened? Why was your harvest so poor when Bernard's field right next door had flourished? And she responded, well, Bernard got subsidized fertilizer from the government, and I didn't. African governments spend more than a billion dollars per year on fertilizer subsidy programs. And in the 10 countries that account for the majority of that spending, fertilizer subsidies account for about 30% of all public spending in the agricultural sector. Now, many of these programs are targeted fertilizer subsidy programs, meaning that only farmers selected to participate receive the subsidized fertilizer. This is in contrast to universal subsidy programs where all farmers would have access to the subsidy. So today I'm going to focus on these targeted fertilizer subsidy programs in sub-Saharan Africa. Coming back to Bernard and Mutinta's fields, the difference there is really striking. And Mutinta attributes the difference to the government subsidy program. But would Bernard's field really have looked much different if he hadn't gotten the subsidy? After all, Bernard was a wealthy farmer, powerful farmer, actually the headman or traditional leader in their village. What if Mutinta had been selected to receive the subsidy instead of Bernard? Might her field have looked different? And what if, in general, this subsidy program in Zambia had targeted more farmers like Mutinta and fewer like Bernard? Might it have had greater impacts on fertilizer use and yields and poverty? There's little doubt that fertilizer subsidy programs in Africa have helped millions of farmers to increase their fertilizer use and improve their yields. But are these programs having maximum impact? And if not, what can we do to make them better? And what are the other types of policies and programs and investments that we need to improve smallholder productivity and reduce rural poverty in Africa? Those are the types of things I want to think through with you today. But first, why are African governments spending a billion dollars on fertilizer subsidy programs? Well, there's a few key reasons. The first is that, on average, crop yields in Africa are much lower than in other parts of the world. So in Asia, we see average grain yields of about three to five tons per hectare. And in developed countries, average grain yields can be 10 tons per hectare or more. In sub-Saharan Africa, on average, grain yields are only about one ton per hectare, sometimes even less than that. And a key reason for these low crop yields is low use of chemical fertilizer. Uh, application rates vary a lot from country to country and within countries, but estimates suggest that on average, African farmers are only applying about 13 kilograms of fertilizer per hectare. That's far, far below the developing country average of 94 kilograms per hectare. Now, we all know that the majority of the poor in Africa rely on agriculture indirectly or directly for their livelihoods. And so improving crop yields through increased use of chemical fertilizer and other methods is absolutely essential for reducing hunger and poverty in Africa. One recent study, the Montpellier panel, uh, actually states that no region of the world has succeeded in raising agricultural growth rates and reducing hunger without increasing fertilizer use. It's a pretty powerful statement. Now, African policymakers recognize the critical need to increase fertilizer use. And in 2006, they convened an Africa Fertilizer Summit in Abuja, Nigeria. And there they pledged to improve smallholder farmers' access to fertilizer through these targeted fertilizer subsidy programs and other types of interventions. In the previous year, Malawi had set up one of the first large-scale fertilizer subsidy programs. And early reports were that that was quite successful. Undoubtedly, other policymakers saw the Malawi program and soon followed suit 
and set up similar programs in their own countries. So here we are, some eight or nine years after that Africa Fertilizer Summit. What impacts have these programs been having? How can they be improved? So in order to kind of assess the impacts of these programs, we need to know what their objectives are. And their objectives vary a lot from country to country, but some of the most common objectives are first, increasing fertilizer use, second, raising crop yields and increasing production, and then third, raising incomes and reducing poverty. So let's look at those one by one. So first, have fertilizer subsidy programs in Africa raised fertilizer use? I have a thought experiment for you. So suppose a subsidy program is distributing 100 tons of subsidized fertilizer. How much is that gonna raise total fertilizer use? Is it gonna be 100 tons? Not necessarily, right? It depends on the types of farmers that are targeted. Think back to Mutinta and Bernard. Bernard was a wealthy farmer who could have afforded fertilizer even without the subsidy. When the subsidy is targeted to farmers like Bernard, 100 tons distributed through the program isn't going to raise fertilizer use by 100 tons because some of it's just gonna be replacing what would have been commercial purchases by Bernard. Now, what if it had targeted Mutinta who was poor and couldn't afford fertilizer without the subsidy. Then we're likely to see closer to a 100 ton increase in fertilizer use per 100 tons distributed. When we look at the data from Kenya and Malawi and Zambia, my colleagues and I are finding that 100 tons of fertilizer distributed through those subsidy programs is only increasing fertilizer use by 50 to 60 tons. It's far below that 100 ton mark. And there's many explanations, but a key one is that a lot of the fertilizer is going to farmers that could afford it even without the subsidy. So fertilizer subsidy programs in Africa are increasing fertilizer use, but we can do better. And we can do better by targeting more farmers like Mutinta and fewer like Bernard. Another way that we can increase the impacts of these fertilizer subsidy programs on fertilizer use is by tapping into the power of the private sector and using these programs to build up private sector fertilizer distribution systems. And a um, main way to do that is through voucher coupon programs, where the subsidy beneficiaries get a coupon or voucher that they bring to a private sector fertilizer retailer and redeem for a discount on bags of fertilizer. Now, many of the biggest subsidy programs in Africa actually don't work this way. The program in Malawi and the program in Zambia, both of those distribute fertilizer to subsidy beneficiaries through kind of a dedicated subsidized fertilizer distribution channel that doesn't work through private sector fertilizer retailers. It operates parallel to them, kind of sidelines side them. But some really exciting things can happen when we do engage the private sector and try to use these subsidy programs to build them up. And one exciting example actually does come from Zambia. Um, the main Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock program doesn't use these vouchers, but another ministry, the Ministry of Community Development, Mother and Child Health, is piloting a voucher scheme for one of its subsidy programs. And one of the things that's most exciting about this pilot scheme is how focused the implementers are on learning and innovating. Because actually in the first year that they did this program, it didn't work so well. So they started out doing the pilot, but they only allowed one fertilizer retailer in each of those districts to participate. You can imagine that this could create a lot of problems, right? It gave that one fertilizer retailer a lot of power. And in some cases, that retailer jacked up his or her prices when the voucher recipient went to go and get their subsidized fertilizer. It also meant in some cases that the farmers had to travel a long distance to be able to redeem that voucher. But the implementers didn't give up they said, no, we can do better. And in the second year, they went out and canvassed the area, found all the agro dealers or fertilizer retailers that were there and signed up as many as seemed up to the task. And this was great because it created competition among these fertilizer retailers. They started bidding wars, lowering their prices, trying to capture the business of those voucher holders. They also went mobile in some cases, loading the fertilizer on trucks, bringing it actually out to the villages. Megaphones, fertilizer for sale, fertilizer for sale. And so the, the fertilizer was right there at the doorsteps of these voucher holders. They even brought extra along so that other people with cash in the community 
could have better access to fertilizer. So these are the exciting types of possibilities that can happen with these programs when we engage the private sector rather than sidelining it. And the Maine Zambia program has earmarked some funds to do a voucher scheme this year, and I really hope they have the political will to do it. Another key example of the power of these voucher programs comes from Kano State in Nigeria. Now, in 2009, the government partnered with the International Fertilizer Development Center to do one of these voucher programs. And through a combination of good targeting, getting plenty of mutintas in the mix, by engaging the private sector retailers through the voucher programs, and providing other support services to the retailers, connecting them with farmers, this program, according to my colleagues' research, raised fertilizer use by more than 100 tons per 100 tons distributed. It raised fertilizer use by 113 tons per tons distributed. These are the types of successes that we need to build on to increase the impacts of fertilizer subsidies on fertilizer use. The second set of impacts and objectives I want to think about with you today is the impacts of these programs on crop yields and production. And for this, I have a couple pictures. So, question for you. Got two maize fields again. Which of these maize fields do you think had more fertilizer applied to it? The one on the right is what people are saying. Actually, it's a bit of a trick question, so sorry for that. They had the same level of fertilizer applied to them. Actually, everything about the two fields is identical, except that oh, the field on the left has much higher soil acidity than the field on the right. The field on the right has less acidic soils. Just getting more fertilizer on African farmers' fields is not going to be enough if the soil conditions aren't conducive to the plant being able to take up and use that fertilizer. So when the soil is too acidic, as are many soils in parts of Africa, just piling on more fertilizer, even if we increase fertilizer use, we're not going to see much of an impact on yields. We'd see a similar picture if we had two fields with two different levels of soil organic matter. If the soil organic matter is too low, the nutrients aren't available to the plant. And so improving the quality of soils on African farmers' fields is absolutely critical. We need a more holistic approach to improving soil fertility and yields in Africa that goes beyond just fertilizer subsidies. A second picture here. The question this time is, which of these fields had subsidized fertilizer applied to it? The one on the left? OK, the one on the left does look healthier, but it was another trick question. Sorry. It's the field on the right that had subsidized fertilizer applied to it. But the problem here was that it arrived much too late. So these fields belong to Evelyn, also a farmer in southern Zambia. And unlike Mutinta, she was fortunate enough to be selected to participate in the subsidy program. So she paid her down payment for the subsidized inputs, but then had to sit back and wait for it to be distributed by the government, because remember that main program in Zambia doesn't work through private agro-dealers. But unfortunately, there were some logistical challenges, and the rains came, the planting rains came, and her inputs hadn't come yet. So she said, oh my gosh, I have to do something. Fortunately, she had a bit of cash left over, and so she went to an agro-dealer and bought some additional hybrid maize seed and fertilizer. And that's what she planted on the left part of the field. You can see that that part of the field is doing pretty well. It's off to a good start. Eventually, the subsidized inputs came, and she planted them on the right part of the field, but didn't have high hopes um, for that part of her crop. Now, Evelyn was lucky to have had cash left over to go and buy these additional inputs. But many farmers that participate in the subsidy program may have all the extra cash that they had locked up in that down payment for the subsidy program. And they're sort of held hostage by you know, whether or not it's going to come on time. They don't have any control over that. So these fertilizer subsidy programs have had some positive impacts on yields and production. But we can do better. And we can do better, again, by having a more holistic approach to increasing soil fertility and yields, and by prioritizing timely availability of these inputs through subsidy programs, but also through private sector channels. The last set of impacts I wanted to think about with you today is impacts on incomes and poverty. Now, these impacts have been, I think, a bit more disappointing than the others, and it again comes back in part to targeting. 
So the programs have seemed to have raised incomes a bit, but have not had much of an effect on poverty. And you say, how can that be? Because income is a function, or poverty is a function of income. How does that work? Well, think back again to Bernard and Mutinta. When the subsidy goes to Bernard, it could increase his incomes because he's paying less for fertilizer. But if he's already above the poverty line, we're not going to see much, if any, impact on the poverty rate. And that's what I'm seeing in the data from Zambia and what we're seeing in similar countries. In Zambia, participating in the subsidy program raises farmers' incomes by about 16%, $42 per capita. That's, you know, substantial. But it's only reducing the probability of falling below the poverty line or the poverty rate by one percentage point against a rural poverty rate of 78%. So these programs are having some impact, but we can do better through better targeting. But I think we also need to ask ourselves, are fertilizer subsidy programs the most cost-effective way to reduce rural poverty? They may not be. We need to look at other options. So kind of summing up, these fertilizer subsidy programs are having an impact, but we can do better by targeting more farmers like Mutinta and fewer like Bernard by taking a more holistic approach to soil fertility management and improving yields, not viewing fertilizer subsidies as a silver bullet. We can do better by engaging the private sector through voucher schemes and other innovative ideas. We can do better by prioritizing timely availability of these inputs to farmers. So I focus a lot on how to make these subsidy programs better, and I decided to take that angle because these programs have a lot of staying power. Once they're set up, they're very difficult to get rid of, kind of like letting the genie out of the bottle. It's tough to get it back in. But I think we also need to ask ourselves, are these fertilizer subsidy programs really addressing the structural causes of low fertilizer use in Africa? Or are they just more kind of short-term fixes that might raise fertilizer use and yields in, in the short run, but when they're removed, might not have a lasting impact? I think we also have to ask ourselves if these programs are the best use of scarce government resources. Remember, a billion dollars per year, or 30% of agricultural sector budgets, in some cases up to 70% of ag sector budgets, are going to this one program. Where is the money coming from when you're spending that much money on fertilizer subsidy programs? Where is the money coming from for the other types of really important investments that we know drive productivity growth and reduce rural poverty? And those are things like investments in rural roads, and agricultural research and development, and extension, and health, and education. Those types of programs have time and time again been shown to have higher returns per dollar invested than fertilizer subsidy programs. We need to be prioritizing those types of investments as well. So fertilizer subsidy programs are having an impact we can do better, and doing better may mean shifting some funds away from these fertilizer subsidy programs and towards these known drivers of agricultural growth and poverty reduction, the roads and the ag R&D and extension and the like. And those types of investments can improve the profitability of fertilizer use as well, right? With better roads, the price that the farmer has to pay for fertilizer will come down because the transport costs will be less. With better roads, the price that the farmer gets for his or her crop will be higher because less of that price is being chewed up by transport costs. And with better ag R&D and extension, we can improve the yield response of crops to fertilizer, and we can pr improve the quality of African soils to make those fertilizers work better. So fertilizer subsidy programs are having an impact, but we can do better. So what can you do? I have three suggestions. Inform reform and advocate. So inform yourself and others about who's benefiting from these programs, what impacts are they having, and how can they be improved. And here I really encourage you to get beyond the headlines and the rhetoric and conventional wisdom and get into the empirical evidence, because it's often quite different. And then second, reform. Push for reforms to the program, that they be improved for greater impact, and that these voucher schemes or other methods of trying to improve the private sector be explored. And then lastly, advocate. Advocate for a more holistic approach to improving soil fertility and yields and productivity and rural livelihoods in Africa. Fertilizer subsidy programs are having an impact, but we can and we must do better. Thank you.